What are you focused on? Have you ever thought about it? It is a fact that a lot of things are calling for your attention in life. But what you focus on is your decision. Among so many things that you are exposed to, it is your choice which of them you respond to. But perhaps the wisest thing for you to do is to focus on God, the very source of life. When you do this, He will give you the proper perspective on everything. It clearly says in John 1, 5, that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. God is one with His Word, meaning that His Word is the light. Therefore, you focus on God by constantly dwelling on His Word. His Word gives you the true definition and explanation of everything. Life is demystified for the Christian who dwells on God's Word. This is so important because from the beginning, God never wanted man to walk in darkness. God, who is light, could not have made man in his own image and placed him in darkness. This was why he put a light in a place before he made man. Darkness signifies confusion, uncertainty, chaos, crisis, fear, evil, death, etc. Whatever is outside God, you don't need it. It will only get you into trouble. Adam and Eve were getting along well with themselves and God until the serpent came. Before this, God had given Adam his mandate and told him how to conduct himself. Adam and Eve did not need anything outside God to fulfill his purpose. But Eve fell for the serpent's bait and got Adam involved. Much of our troubles as Christians today are traceable to a lack of light in our hearts or a failure to apply it. And when we have not received the light, which is God's word, we are likely to seek answers outside of it. This is the realm of darkness. But the Bible charges in the book of Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace into your hearts to the Lord. When you learn to focus on God, you will not be weighed down by the issues of life. God, through his word, teaches you all things and fills you with wisdom for life. No wonder it says that. And ye are complete within him which is the head of all principality and power, Colossians 2.10. No matter the challenges you are facing now, do not let them break your focus on God. This is their intent, to turn you from God in search of solutions. In Chronicles 16, the Bible shows the account of Asa, king of Judah, whose reign began to witness decline when he sought help from men rather than God at a time of war, and when he feet got diseased, settle it in your mind that God has all the answers to the issues before you, and nothing can make him by surprise. Jesus Christ, speaking in the book of Matthew 6.33, said, But seek ye first in the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. God brought you into his wisdom, God brought you into his kingdom through Jesus Christ. He did not save you for yourself. You need to learn how his kingdom functions and what your role is. As you do this, God will take care of every issue in your life, one after the other. As you cooperate with him in expanding his kingdom on earth through the gospel, he will meet your needs. God's priority is to have all men saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. Partner with him in this regard and let him take responsibility for your life. Do not wait until you have the time. Create it. Do wait till you have a lot of money. Start using what you have. God is a multiplier and he is looking for men and women that he can trust. With opportunities, platforms, and wealth, do not lose sight of God in pursuit of anything. Approach everything with the light of God. If you try to run your life all by yourself, you will be drained and frustrated. 
you will be faced with challenges that only God can take care of. God wants you to depend totally on Him so that you can stay refreshed at all times. God has the power to do many things in different places all at once without being overwhelmed. He is not a man, but a spirit. Jesus Christ speaking in the book of Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Stay in constant fellowship with God and you will not struggle because his wisdom will be evident in all you do. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you have the life and nature of God in you. This means that you have the capacity to function like God and get his kind of results. In this way, nothing you do fails because you are one spirit with him. Even when you pray, do not spend too much time asking God for things. Concentrate on ministering to Him in thanksgiving, worship, and praises. Believe that He always knows what to do. It is during such times that you will have visions and receive clear guidance in answer to prayers, and sometimes it will not be your own prayer. It was while he was praying that God gave Peter a vision to reach out to Cornelius the Gentile with the gospel. God can give you a vision for your family, your business, and your community, but your heart must be open to him. You can admire what God is doing in the lives of other men and women, but if you focus on him, he will show you what to do with your own life. He has a blueprint for your destiny, but you must not be in a hurry. Moses the prophet spent 40 days on Mount Sinai with God where he summoned to receive the Ten Commandments for the nation of Israel. God loves to test and train men before he commits valuable things to them. Focus is a major ingredient for success in any endeavor. You must be able to recognize and avoid distractions. There are activities that drain your time and energy, but they are not important. A lot of people are failing because they have not learned to prioritize their activities. The first thing for you to do each morning is to pray and meditate on the Word of God. This is where you receive wisdom for a fruitful day. Make a decision that your television and radio should be switched off at this time. It shows how important such moments are to you. Your phone also should be on flight mode. Let people around you know how special such times are to you. Even when you are done praying, keep your mind on God. God will keep you in peace when your mind is on Him. You will confidently get into the day's program knowing that everything will turn out well, no matter how good your plans are. Without the hand of God, you will struggle to see them fulfilled. What God does is help you deal with any emergencies capable of making you derail. You must realize that your plans are not as perfect as you think. As you walk with God, He will go beyond your plans and do you good. Be willing to allow Him to modify those plans so that he, they can align with His. Divine guidance is superior to your plans, no matter how detailed they are. If God is leading you to abandon your plans totally, then cooperate with Him for your own good. His ways are always higher than yours. And what really matters to you are not the plans themselves, but getting results through them. In walking with God, one of his attributes you should take note of is he is dynamic. What he will tell you to do in a particular situation now may not be the same thing he will tell you to do if a similar situation arises in the future. The Israelites needed what to drink in the wilderness. So God instructed Moses to strike the rock of Horeb. When Moses obeyed, water came out and the people drank. But another time, when Israel needed water, God told Moses to speak to the rock this time around. Moses struck the rock again and water came out. But God was displeased. You must trust God enough to obey the new instruction, even when it does not make any sense to you. 
What worked yesterday may not be acceptable today. Do not seek new ways by yourself. Let it come from God. God can speak through circumstance or during a conversation. It does not have to be spectacular. Sometimes we jump out of our house and go about looking for money. It is a big mistake to seek God first before things because you will find it difficult to hear him when your mind is not on him. The voice of God can save you money and can even save your life because God knows what is ahead. All that glitters is not gold. So wake up early enough to seek God above everything else. Succeeding is not about how many places you went or how many things you are doing. You are not competing with anyone but yourself. If you were ignorant of what I have been sharing, there is no need for any regrets. Just start putting them to work so that your future can be better. Be very patient with yourself because it takes some time to get used to it. As they say, Rome was not built in a day. Be very determined to do it. If you make mistakes, do not beat yourself. Be encouraged and keep at it. It takes tenacity to adopt the new routine. Your family and those around you will need to adjust to it. But your life will certainly be more productive. Look around you and make inquiry. All successful people have a daily routine that their lives follow in accordance with, with their pursuit. Business, academics, arts, sports, etc. Nobody stumbles into true success. It is always traceable to deliberate steps practiced over a period of time. It is hard, but smart work. It involves continuous unlearning and relearning. Knowledge needs to be reviewed and updated when necessary because what you knew five years ago may have become obsolete today. Be very current in your field. You are growing even if the results are not yet visible. Just stay on track. We experience sentiments and ties to the past on a regular basis. The past is difficult to let go of, and it has an emotional impact on us. So how can we let go of the past, forgetting about the past so that we may focus on the future? How can we let go of our guilt, our actions, and the injustices that have been committed to us? We won't be able to change the past, but we will be able to learn from it. The past exists to help you train, develop, and mold yourself into a person God wants you to be right now. If you don't learn from your mistakes, you will remain angry, resentful, and worse, you will be wistful for the good old days. Living in the past is a difficulty because it requires you to see God rather than yourself and all of your mistakes or other people's failures. Instead of being concerned about God failing to provide for your future, you should be concerned about what your future might be like without Him. According to the Bible, what wicked fear will come to pass, therefore we should be afraid of leaving God out of our future plans, rather than having a hard time trusting God's plan for us. You can't predict the future, but you can learn about the person who is in charge of it, God. You become scared, domineering, and selfish if you don't trust God. We are delighted and anticipate great things when we trust God. The next task is not to be fearful, but to have greater faith in God. How much do you put your faith in God for your future? I find that the more difficult life becomes, the more I want to be in charge of it. Consider what the Bible says about the past in Hebrews 12, verse 11. We do not enjoy being disciplined. It is painful at the time, but later, after we have learned from it, we have peace because we start living in the right way. In the past, before we were born again, we were devil's children and were separated from God. We were dead in our sins and facing everlasting punishment. We were imprisoned in sin before we were born again, and on our way to the eternal fire and eternal alienation from our Creator God. We have become children of God and joint heirs with Christ because we were rescued by the grace through our faith. 
we now have the assurance of everlasting life, spiritual kingship, and an inheritance set apart for us in high realms. This is a tremendous promise to you today. No matter what condemnation you have faced in the past, focus on the great plan that your Heavenly Father has for you. Quit focusing on the past. He has your best interests at heart, and thus your future is secure. Having God as your Father and Christ as your teacher is a blessing and an honor. But with tremendous blessing comes great duty. You are asked to follow in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ as God's adopted child. You will waste the present by being unfocused and reacting if you don't learn from how God has moved in the past and if you don't trust God with the future. The Bible encourages us to turn our attention away from ourselves and our issues, including our past, and on to God, as well as to appreciate our limits as a blessing. We must unclutter our hearts, focus our prayers, and understand clearly what God is asking us to accomplish with our life in order to shift our emphasis. And give my son Solomon an uncluttered and focused heart so that he can obey what you command. Live by your directions and counsel and carry through with building the temple for which I have provided. 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 19. Do you enjoy going fishing? The prospect of catching the big one may make your heart race. I know how much I like fishing with my kids. It's always a fantastic time. However, in Mark 1, verse 17, we find Jesus' comments on fishing. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men, the scripture says. Jesus' transformation into a man fisherman indicated that he would utilize his disciples to expand God's kingdom. God has something bigger in mind for Andrew and Simon in the future. They were to stop doing what they had been doing for their entire lives and let go of their pasts. Are you ready to let go of that past to which you are so clinging to? Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. You may be overly attached to your acquaintances, with the majority of them holding you back, but you are hesitant to take the first step to move on from them. You may have been horribly hurt in the past by someone you truly trusted, and you have been suspicious of everyone God brings your way. You may have lost your spouse, son, daughter, or a parent in a tragic accident and have been unable to move on. You may have been wrongfully charged and sentenced for something you never committed, and as a result, you are unable to obtain a decent employment, mortgage, or loan. You have the impression that your life has been trapped in a bubble. Today, Christ invites you to cast all of your worries on Him. Are you ready to let go of everything today and follow Him? Take the step that the two men took and follow Him today. He is something better for you. God calls us regardless of where we are or what we have done in the past. Simon and Andrew were out on the water fishing. You may be at church, at work, or outgoing about your business. Jesus desires for us to assist him in bringing people into the kingdom. We don't need to be socialites or rich to participate. Just like Simon and Andrew did when they laid down their nets and followed Jesus, we must love him and obey him. For you to be a modern-day fisherman, you must broaden your horizons and explore beyond the bubble in which you live. You must look past whatever has happened in the past. Your life's purpose changes, and you realize that human values are becoming more essential than monetary prosperity. He is something better for you, more valuable than money or fame. What are the consequences of being trapped in the past? What happens if you are unable to reconcile your past? What if you are unable to respond to God's call because you are bound by your past? I've got some bad news for you. If you can't let go of your past, you're doomed. Take, for example, the story of Lot's wife. Her name is not given in the Bible, 
she is simply referred to as Lot's wife in Genesis 19 verse 26, although Jews refer to her as Adith or Irith. Many commentators believe Lot's wife was a resident of Sodom, which would explain her desire for the city and its inhabitants, as well as her turning to watch its destruction and turning into a pillar of salt. God commanded Lot and his family not to look back in Genesis 19, verse 17. As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, flee for your lives, don't look back, and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. According to the Bible, Lot's wife remained behind amid the haste to leave Sodom. We make a sincere attempt to stand by Christ's side when we make the decision to follow him. As time passes though, we may find ourselves falling back into our old habits and company. She did, however, linger behind before returning her gaze to the metropolis. She was struck dead as a result of her reluctance and disobedience, and her grace period expired. Despite the fact that Lot was caught up in the immoral state of Sodom, his steadfast retreat eventually saved him from destruction. There is no such thing as a half-saved or half-lost provision. There is no middle ground when it comes to our faith. Either we are faithful or we're not. Most Christians, like Lot's wife, have struggled to come to terms with their history. Perhaps you were an addict, and despite attending seminars and promising God to leave drugs, you still sneak and take a few sniffs or puffs of that secret drug. Perhaps you promised God to leave the company of that bad friend, but you still sneak notes to them or see them in secret. Perhaps you promised God to leave sexual immorality, but you always slip back and make the same mistake, and so on. God wants you to be able to let go of the past and make peace with it because he has something better in mind for you. You can choose to follow Lot's example and never look back, saving yourself from devastation. God always saves his faithful. He won't let that situation overwhelm you. He has something better for you. Paul was a well-to-do, highly respected, high-ranking Pharisee who despised and persecuted Christians in his previous life. God threw him from his high horse, blinded him, and showed himself to Paul one day on the way to Damascus with authorization in his hands to imprison saints. All of that pride vanished in a single God shot. Then came the true anguish. Here's what Paul had to say about his life in Philippians. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Philippians 3 verse 8. That's a powerful statement. Everything, surpassing, all, and rubbish were among the words used. When he wrote this, he was imprisoned. Philippians is a letter full of gladness and happiness, as well as encouragement to believers to do the same. It is time for you to make peace with your terrible history, like Paul did, and choose to completely serve God today. Paul's story shows us that no past is too hard for God to forgive. He is a forgiving father. He is a God of second chances. Do not be guided by guilt, but confess to him today, and he will take that heavy yoke off your shoulders and make you whole again. He has something bigger for you. Trust me when I say today, I mean the day and age in which we live. It is becoming increasingly difficult to hang in there steadily. Do you look at your life sometimes and it just feels like nothing makes sense and you just want to throw in the towel, you know, just give up. I want to show you today that in spite of all you have been through or are going through right now, God has not brought you this far to leave you. You could look at your school, your work, your family, your business, even your local church or the global church, and you would almost scream your lungs out at God, like, how are things just going out of order? Why? Sometimes the burdens that you deal with in every sphere of your life can be so overwhelming and difficult that the one thing 
which seems the easiest and more comfortable to do, is give up. Why? Because your faith is being heavily tested. You are hard pressed on every side, and it's almost as if you are stuck in the middle with no way forward or backward. Permit me to share something else with you right here. Remember, I just told you that I do understand that feeling. Now, let me tell you the greatest part. I don't stop there. That's right. Sharing these words with you right now is proof that I am with something far better, and I would love to share it with you. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 9. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Why does the great apostle Paul add yet and but after the declaration of each predicament? You see, those are the points that make the difference. It is the point where the apostle and his team move from the camp of quitters to the camp of winners. The servant of God acknowledges their pains, their frustration. Then in each case, he indirectly puts us to remembrance of proof that his back is not yet on the ground. It is as if the apostle is telling you, there is no doubt that there is so much trouble on every side, but we are not going to let it distress us. There is so much perplexity enough to make us worry, but we aren't worried. Everyone is turning against us for what we believe in, but we know that God hasn't abandoned us. We are not the forgotten, and therefore, even though we get knocked down by challenges, we will bounce back because that's not going to be our grave. What great heart from a man like you and me. My friend, you just can't give up just yet. You can't come this far in the fight and then just quit like it is all for nothing. Let me remind you, this is not the beginning. You didn't start here, remember? You have held on for long. You have fought for long. You have believed in that dream for long. You have stood your ground against all odds and decided that no matter what happened, you would keep fighting until you made it. So, let me ask you, although people are quitting and throwing in the towel around you, that's not you. Say it, that's not me. Galatians 1.4. Who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father? Every one of us is living for something, whether you are aware of it or not, whether you like it or not, whether you are intentional about it or not. No one of us is purposeless. This just means one thing or another to each person, as he or she would want it to mean. However, Although the true meaning of purpose would be what God arranged for you to primarily do on earth with your life while here, we can choose to fill that up with things that we consider much more needed in our lives. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Some of us are chasing the bag, some the academic achievements, some the fame, some serving others. The list just goes on. However, in all of these, Here's something I want you to see and take note of, that you are still alive today. There is still time for you here on earth, and you are valuable to the purpose of God right here, right now, whether you are aware of what it is or not. Another thing I want you to know is that you made it this far in your life's journey, not because you were careful to avoid danger, or you were strong enough to persevere, or you were disciplined, or there was simply no danger along the way. No. You made it this far in your journey because of God's presence with you and your faith that somehow, through the power working in you, God's power actually, you would make it to the finish line. If God has kept you this far through everything you have gone through, if Christ gave himself upon Calvary's cross for our sins, don't you think that God can also deliver you from the troubles of this present time also? Come to think of it, is it really that difficult for him? I guess you already know the answer to that one, my dear friend. No doubt, the pain is real. The struggle is real. The losses and disappointments are real. The failures and frustrations are real. You look at yourself and it seems nothing is happening in your life and there seems to be no hope of sunlight appearing over the horizon any moment soon. However, still, you just can't give up. Now, let me bring you into the main idea God didn't carry you through everything you went through just to leave you here. No, he did it, my friend. See, the bottom line that I believe was Paul's inspiration and which should be yours too after listening to this. 
Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Prior to the challenges you're faced with right now, did you believe that whatever was happening in your life was good? Would you accept that at least the fact that you are alive is a good thing that God has done and is doing for you? If yes, then be very aware that He has put it upon Himself not to rest until He has completed the very thing He wants to do in and through your life. Remember, I told you that we are all cut out to fit into a master plan, a blueprint that only God knows about. Somehow, we only see a fragment of the big picture and live our lives trying to fulfill our part in it. So, if He's allowed you and kept you this far on your journey, then He has plans to do better in your life more than you have already seen. See it here in Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Do you see this? In the presence, God's thought is on you. And guess what? His thoughts are set on your future. Fret not, my friend. Will the same one with a plan for your future leave you stranded? Will he promise you everything only to abandon you? Let me show you what his word says in this regard so that you can know that the voice you have been hearing isn't the right one, and you should start listening to the right voice. Isaiah 49, 15. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. There is a higher chance a mother forgetting her child than of God forgetting or abandoning you. He just doesn't do that. He can't do that. It's his very nature to be faithful. 2 Corinthians 2.13 If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Faithfulness to his promise is his ideal, his nature. Just as the sun cannot be shining, the wind cannot be blowing, and we cannot but breathe unless we are dead. And God cannot but be faithful. He cannot but love. Therefore, when you feel like giving up, remember these things. It is not yet time to quit. But if it is not yet time to quit, what time is it then? It is time for this. Isaiah 43, 19. See, I am doing a new thing. Now, it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Cry if you have to cry, but don't you dare quit. Don't you dare. God wants to do great things in your life, and he needs you aboard that plan. You can't be there if you die or just give up. Therefore, when you cry your heart out, open your eyes and see. That's right. You have to be able to see. That's what the Bible says. There's no point in saying you are in the center of God's plan and being blind to it. In order for you to receive strength to go forward, you need to start seeing again. Do you know that you stop believing because you stop seeing? You stop moving because your eyes stop seeing where you are supposed to be headed. Now, God wants your faith awakened through the vision of his good purpose for your future. What is God's plan for your future? Good. What does he have in store for you? Good. You are not meant to die here. You are not meant to stop here. This is part of the process. You are in the process. This is the storm. You don't die in the storm. You conquer it. That's who you are. That's what you do. You conquer. Romans 8, 37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Say that to yourself. I am not going to end like this. This is not how my story ends. I do not die here. I make it to the finish line. Yes, I make it. I have this. Why? Because God is on my side. He is not going to let me fall by the wayside. Yes, things are going to be hard sometimes, but after the rainfall, there will be the sunshine. The night may be long and filled with sadness, but I won't despair. My story is that of a man greatly helped by God. This is my story. This is my song. I win in this story. 
I make it. I stand. I prevail. God has not brought me this far to leave me. No, I refuse to believe this. I am more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. I will forge ahead and I will prevail. Knowing and pursuing God's plan for our lives is undoubtedly one of the most important heart issues that Christians face. Child of God, the Lord desires for you to be in His will even more than you desire to be. Keep His will in mind, but don't make it an idol in your life. Seek the Lord diligently, and as the Bible instructs, rely on Him to direct you on His path. Too often, when we rely on God solely to provide us with a formula, we miss out on the best that He has in store for us. He really does want our allegiance. The Hebrew word we use to translate obey in English is the same one we use to translate here in Hebrew. Rather, this is an investigation that leads to action. Listen, the Lord wants a one-on-one -on -one relationship with each of us. He wants us to hear His voice, to know Him, and respond to Him. Every time we adhere to the general principles of being a Christian, God reveals the specifics when they're required. You must know that the knowledge of God's will is critical. The question now is, how do I know what the Lord wants me to do? 1. Make an effort to gain a deeper knowledge of God. Psalm 27.8 says, My heart says of you, seek His face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. A faith in which we are seen as saviors who bear the burdens of others and are the source of every good deed and triumph is a faith in which God's will is put second to our own. Everything boils down to our efforts to stay on God's narrow path if we separate seeking His will from seeking to know Him. We must first examine our own motives before we can pray for the Lord to reveal His will for us in a given situation. Whether or not we really want to know God is a question that we must answer for ourselves. 2. Allow the Lord to direct you. The believer must be confident that God is at work in his life in directing him. David said about God in Psalm 23, 3, You lead me in paths of righteousness for the sake of your name. David put his faith in God, knowing that it was he who would lead him in the right direction, no matter what circumstances arose. In the New Testament, we're reminded that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to finish it. Our quest to discover God's will for our lives cannot be separated from the necessity of placing our trust in Him at every step of the way. Faith can never be completely replaced by knowledge, and it will never be possible for it to be. Learn to pray for direction in your situation and ask God for it. The Bible tells us that if we ask God for wisdom, He will give it to us freely. Then it tells us, Matthew 7, 7 to 8 says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. The mysteries of the universe are not revealed in these verses. In spite of this, they reveal the heart of a loving God who desires that His people approach Him with their needs. As a well-versed expert in the art of giving gifts to those who ask, God longs for the hearts of His people. Listen, there are many fundamental truths that we can learn and apply from Scripture as we seek to align our lives with God's plan. This is why the Lord told us in the book of Joshua to meditate upon His Word day and night. 3. Become a better person with God's help. 2 Timothy 3, 1-4 says, this is right and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Then in John 13, 34, Jesus tells us to love one another as He's loved you. To love one another as Christ loved the church is Jesus' new commandment. Love is the culture of the believer, and it is what the Lord wants us to do. God is love, 
And it is His will that we love truly as He's loved us. Remember, He has loved us from when we were sinners, and He loves us still. Showing love daily helps us become better, and it helps us express Christ more. The will of God is grounded in love, and it is through love that we understand His will per time. Then in Romans 12, 1-2, Paul says, Therefore, brothers, by God's mercies, I implore you to offer your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, suitable and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Furthermore, do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind to demonstrate what God's will is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. You see, God wants us to live daily for Him, to live as sacrifices, to become better and to grow in Him daily. The best way to find God's will is to dive into His Word. In His Word, He tells us to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, and to be thankful at all times. It is His will that we do these things. It is part of His plan that you learn to rejoice, give thanks, and pray. Furthermore, there are verses in the Bible that act as a safety net. If we can't live the way these verses describe, there's a good chance we need to change or eliminate something from our lives. Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. This means the little things you do should be done in the name of Jesus with thanksgiving. The big things you do should be done in the name of Jesus with thanksgiving to God. All that you say must be in the name of Jesus. Jesus Christ must be seen in you. 4. Seek first God's kingdom and righteousness. The Bible tells us to pursue first His kingdom and His righteousness, which is what we should be pursuing. It's now up to you to decide if you're going to be seeking the approval of men or God. Are you trying too hard to win the approval of men? You would no longer be a servant of Christ if you were still putting the needs of others ahead of my own. In Galatians 1.10, Paul writes, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant to Christ. For the believer, it should be God first, kingdom first, holiness first, God's will first. Many believers often get lost thinking that God's will is a complex thing that will be impossible for them to do. But that is a wrong notion. God's will is what we seek, pursue after, chase, and go after His kingdom, His work, His word. Do you understand? This is what the Lord wants us to do. It is in doing the things of God that we truly find satisfaction. How can we determine God's will in a particular situation? Start by reading the Bible. It can be extremely helpful to color code Bible verses to subject matter when you need wisdom for specific issues, such as relationships or finance. Then you'll be able to quickly find the relevant verses in your Bible. Other excellent resources include books that compile collections of scripture on a wide range of life issues. Try to find Bible verses or stories about people who've been in similar situations to you. Then make sure to pray for wisdom and insight. Inquire about how to apply the Lord's teachings to your current situation by expressing your concerns to Him. At times, the spiritual and emotional depths of the Bible go beyond our ability to grasp. Finding a verse and clinging to it as if it were gospel truth is a simple process. In spite of this, the Lord's commanded us to live generously. The Bible refers to this as the gift God bestowed upon Solomon. A larger heart was given to him in order to help him put his wisdom into action. Seek the Lord's guidance on how to put His words into action in your life. But child of God, this must be done quickly. Before He began His public ministry, Jesus fasted for 40 days in preparation. We should follow Jesus' example and set time aside for prayer and fasting, among other things, before making significant change in our lives. Furthermore, child of God, have faith in God and wait for His timing. Even when we've done everything we should, the Lord's path doesn't always become apparent right away. Practicing patience while under the protection of God's wing is a great way to prepare for the next step in our journey. 
Our best course of action is to do the next right thing that comes our way while we wait. When it comes to obeying God, go back to the basics. If you'd like people to pray for you, do so. As he prayed in a quiet place in Gethsemane, Jesus invited his friends to join him in a private conversation with the Lord. In light of the Lord's example, we should strive to live up to it. Finally, keep an eye out for any doors that may be open or closed. Because of God's hand on him, David had to be patient and reliant on him in order to become king of Israel. Waiting for God's timing to align the circumstances around him, he waited. The Holy Spirit thwarted his plans to continue preaching in Asia despite his strong desire to do so. Because of the Lord's intervention in the form of circumstances, Paul was unable to travel. However, we must be aware that the Lord uses circumstances to communicate with us. We have to keep going in some situations, no matter what. Even though we may look for God in the wind, fire, and earthquakes as Elijah did, we may find him in the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. In order to see God's hand at work in the situations that come your way, pray for discernment. They say challenges are the breakfast of champions. How true is this? Why should there be difficulties? I am grinding so that I can live a life without difficulties. Let me affect that mindset. Difficulties are part of a life that is making steady progress, or attempting to at least. Not everyone will have privilege. Sometimes not even those with privilege know what to do with it. Understand and accept that. You have to learn a new skill. It's a new challenge that may prove difficult. You want to go to school, get ready to challenge us. You want to build your business, there will be difficulties. Listen, everything that involves any kind of progress will face difficulties. These are a fundamental part of life, just the way pains contribute to growth and intelligence. Difficulties separate those who win and those contending to win from those who lose or those who quit. Whatever category you find yourself, dear believer, if you can understand what difficulties truly are, you will thank God for your difficulties. Difficulties bring out the fight in you and position you for the next level. They distinguish between ordinary dreamers and those pressing to bring their dreams into reality. Romans 8.18 I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. As long as you are alive, you will have present sufferings, times when you will feel pressed on every side, times when unexpected challenges will sweep you off your feet. You will come face to face with things that make you afraid. You will come into an environment where you are treated different from others. You will face some crises alone when you expected your friends to be there. You will face situations that will push you into the corner and try to squeeze the life out of you. Family, health, marriage, career, children, injustice, segregation, addiction, troubled teenager, economic crises, the list just goes on. However, I come to tell you something. You can rise above life's difficulties. You can live as an overcomer. Paul, the apostle, talking about their difficulties in ministry, began to show us that regardless of the difficulties faced, the overcomer's life is possible. Possess the overcomer's attitude. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 11. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Paul confessed the troubles, the perplexities, and the persecution they faced each time on their journey and to which they were subject, expecting to happen any day or time. Yet, Paul spoke in the language of the overcomer, 
Although these difficulties are there, we are not of those who despair. We are not of those who feel like we have been forsaken because we are not forsaken. These challenges knock us down, but you know what? It can't destroy us. It can hit us hard, make us cry, surround and overwhelm us, but it can't consume us, never. This is the language and the attitude of winners. This is how they wear out their difficulties instead of being worn out themselves. Remember, this same Paul declares later to us, Romans 8, 36 through 37, as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. In the midst of trying and failing, we are more than conquerors. In the midst of the trials, we are more than conquerors. In the midst of the disqualification, you are more than a conqueror. So many people have looked at their lives and wondered why it seems like they are stuck, like this is their destiny, like they aren't meant for anything else, like they are going to be buried by the sandstorm of life's difficulties, by the weights of everything they are dealing with. They have the passion, they have the resolve, they haven't quit yet. They still have the fight in them, yet they haven't been able to live above those difficulties nor entered into the experience of the overcomer's life. But the Bible says in 1 John 4.4 4 and 1 John 5.4 respectively, you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. And also, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. What do you think? What is the missing link? The life of Joseph is a great example of someone who rose above life circumstances and difficulties to live as an overcomer. What do you think about the actions of his brothers against him? It wasn't his fault that he was different, that he had dreams. It wasn't his fault that he was so determined to win in life. Although he probably first thought his reign would be over his brothers, not knowing that God had a greater plan in store. However, Consider what Joseph had to go through. His own brother sold him for a few pieces of silver, not because they were broke, not because they needed the cash, but simply because they wanted to see his dreams die. Look, many things may beat you down, but as long as you have the power to dream, you have the power to rise again. As long as you have the power to see new horizons, you have a reason to live and fight for another day. Joseph is that guy who faced extreme difficulties. He was used to being surrounded by family. He was his father's favorite child. He was special. He loved being special. He enjoyed his father's affection and support. Joseph could run around the whole land because it was familiar to him. His family owned a large portion of it. He lived almost like royalty. Then in one fell swoop, it was all taken away from him. This same Joseph was sold into slavery and being brought to the land of Egypt, landed in the house of Potiphar, the chief security officer to the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh. Did Joseph ask for this? No, he didn't. This young man just wanted to dream and live in it. He never wanted to harm anybody. He wasn't a threat to anyone except the ego of his brothers. And because they could, they made an attempt to crush him. Have you met people who just give you a hard time, not because they do anything wrong, but simply because they can? They make things difficult for you simply because they have the power. The greatest disadvantage you can do to yourself in such a time is allow their actions to make you feel like you aren't worth anything or that you are a failure. However, Joseph would not be cast down. No. Remember the attitude of the winner that the Apostle Paul showed us. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 9. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Joseph would rise from an ordinary young foreign slave to become the chief servant in Potiphar's house. Everything would seem fine for a while, and the difficulties would appear like they're gone. But honestly, 
Difficulties are never truly gone. They may take a break for a season, but that is just enough time for you to enjoy the moment, take it all in, and then prepare for the next wave. Why? Because reinforcements will come. Someone once said, for every new levels, there are new devils. The challenges you faced when you were in the previous level will be far different from those you will face in the new level. So always be on guard. We are not magnifying challenges in our message, but we want to use this to show you that, look, it doesn't have to crush you. Stop living below whom you were made to live as an overcomer. Just like Joseph, you too can rise above the difficulties of your life. You too can win. You are an overcomer. Don't forget that. You are an overcomer. You were not born to fail. You were born to win. 3 John 1 verse 2. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. Things are meant to end well for you. There is room for everyone in the hall of success, but sadly, not everyone gets into it. Joseph would go on to have his morality challenged by his boss's wife, and then he would be falsely accused and imprisoned. He had become a slave. Now, there in the land of his slavery, despite staying away from trouble, he was framed for something he didn't do. Yet in that prison, Joseph did not change. He was still an overcomer. He still believed in who he was, and he helped others. This is where we hear him say, Genesis 40, 14 through 15, but when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. Speak like an overcomer. Although Joseph was in a difficult situation, not only was he having the attitude of an overcomer, which made him took his eyes off himself, but being a beacon of hope to those around him, Joseph spoke his destiny. I do not belong here. Yes, it took a while, but a day came when the attitude and the words he spoke about himself came alive. And instead of being head of inmates, Joseph got his destiny as the leader of Egypt under Pharaoh. Psalms 105, 18 through 22. They bruised his feet with shackles. His neck was put in irons till what he foretold came to pass, till the word of the Lord proved him true. The king sent and released him. The ruler of people set him free. He made him master of his household, ruler over all he possessed, to instruct his princes as he pleased and teach his elderly wisdom. Has anyone told you that this is where you belong? They lied to you. Where you are now is the least place you can be. Move out of it. Live the overcomer's life. Answer me this. Is there a victory without a fight? The difficulty in your challenge that is a measure of the power you carry. This means that this difficulty in your life right now isn't greater than your potential to overcome it. You have come a long way, my friend. Yes, you have grown. Maybe you didn't know this before, but you have. You aren't where you used to be. You are stronger now. Rise above every life's difficulty thrown at you by the attitude of faith and the confession of your destiny. Your future is great. Do not settle for the small fights when the bigger fight is ahead. And guess what? God is rooting for you. He has your back and you have the advantage. Take this life of the overcomer that is in Christ and ride your way into the victory that is found only in those who put their trust in Jesus Christ. You are a winner. Believe this, you are an overcomer. Rise out of this challenge by reminding yourself who you are. Go. A man is only as good as the people that surround him in life. This is an ageless truth that has held true for so many generations and will stand the test of time till humans no longer exist. If you find a company of five thieves and an innocent friend with no prior record of stealing, it is only a matter of time before this innocent friend becomes the sixth man thief among them. No one can truly claim ignorance of the tremendous impact of company on their lives. You might not have been in control over the kind of primary company you were born into, i.e. your family, 
but you sure have a strong say over the company you choose over the remaining seasons of your life. So many great stories are available through history and in our day and age of such great men who were born into the saddest slums in existence, among the most terrible of thieves, and within the most disastrous of communities. These men and women fought valiantly to make a story of success, despite the odds stacked against them. They gave up anything and everything so they could even have a fighting chance in a society they perceived to be more privileged than their place of birth. This drive has birthed so many unique stories of people who gave their all, despite it all. You are not the first to be at a disadvantage. You will not be the last either. You are not the first to be broken and torn because of unavoidable family influence. But you must rise beyond this into a place that no scar can tarnish. You, dear child of God, have been equipped with supernatural abilities to outlast the opposition and all they could possibly throw at you. You have been carved out to stun your world and generations to come with your ever-expanding hunger to rise beyond limitations, ascend beyond faults, thrive despite opposition, and blossom despite the darkness. There is no force of life, no force of nature, and no background crisis that can keep you on the ground you are made for the greatest heights success in time can offer. Despite the devil's schemes and agenda against God's ever-glorious plans for you. The world bears no grudge against the ones who were born weak and at a disadvantage, but do remember that it sure does kick down those who choose by action or inaction to remain there. There can be no ignorance of this. There is no room to say, I did not know. Nor is there room to claim, there is nothing I could have done about it. You can change the very course of your life and destiny the moment you change the company that surrounds you. So what if your father or mother is abusive? You are not the first. Stop shivering like a child and get your act together by building a positive dome of books that negate that bad influence in your life. You too can be such a massive inspirational story that you completely change the course of your community with the unique story you become from sharing your defiance to laying down and rolling over. You are God's beloved child. He did not set you up for disaster. He set you up for a liftoff. He set you up for a step up to greatness from what seems to be a disastrous background, but really is made to be your biggest motivation not to be small not to be weak, not to be miserable, not to be poor, not to be depressed, but a shining example of disadvantage turned unique super strength born of weakness. There are many fake friends, life-sucking family members, and alliances that are made to ruin your life. You must be fully aware of this and prepared to sever all ties with such people. Some of your relationships are so toxic that you can't birth and nurture a vision or a plan without it dying. For as long as such people are still in your life, their company, foolishness, poverty, and all the atrocities of life are never far away. You can't keep telling everyone you meet about your divinely inspired visions, plans, and agendas. You need to know that not everyone out there is your friend or ally. Not everyone out there is rooting for you. Not all the fans of your life are watching to see you succeed. Some are watching patiently to see you fail and broadcast the news. Hang around like that and in a short while, every glorious thing in your life will soon be tarnished in that space of negativity. Such a sad account is to be warned of in the Bible in 1 Corinthians 15.33. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. If you decide to walk with fools or be indecisive about who surrounds you and the company you keep, their destruction is inevitable. Proverbs 13.20 He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. There will always be wrong company at every turn, but as sons and daughters of God, we must trust God in prayer to keep us from all these foolhardy associations. There once was a man in the Bible known as the first son of David, who was the heir to the throne of the whole of Israel. 
His position was sure and secure, and his father, the King David, loved him dearly. This glorious prince had an odd affection toward his sister and desired to have her. As bad as this thought was, it was destined to never see the light of day through action if only this young prince had the right friend. Sadly, his friend was the end of his life, for he doomed him by advising him on how to have his way with his sister in an illegitimate manner. 2 Samuel 13, 4 and 5, 11 and 14, King James Version. And he said this unto him, Why art thou, being the king's son, lean from day to day? Wilt thou not tell me? And Ammon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. And Jonadab said unto him, Lay thee down on thy bed, and make thyself sit. And when thy father cometh to see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come, and give me meat, and dress the meat in my sight, that I may see it, and eat it at her hand. And when she had brought them unto him to eat, he took hold of her, and said unto her, Come lie with me, my sister. Howbeit he would not hearken unto her voice, but, being stronger than she, forced her, and lay with her. And through this singular act, his great destiny was buried in the ruins of the wrong company. All that shining potential to be the next king of Israel was snuffed out. He never knew that the fight for his glorious throne had long begun with his birth. He never knew that the moment he could decide upon the company he kept, his very life, whether as a king or as a dead, unfulfilled man, was now in his hands. One misstep, and a young man might find himself in the very shoes of this young prince. You ought also to be made aware that, while it is stressed to have good company, it is much more important to have godly and good company. Basically, it is crucial to have a company that fears the Lord and values His instructions in His Word. You might think having a good friend at work with whom you can share your life and speak is sufficient, but you are sorely mistaken. That was the same thought that Solomon, the great and wise king of Israel, once conceived while he spent his time with all kinds of women from several nations and cultures of the earth, with their diversity of religion and conduct. This proved to be a fatal decision for Solomon, for the man who was brought up to love God deeply and dearly had his heart turned away from the Lord for the issuing company that was given by God. This is a crucial lesson as it makes it terribly clear that you cannot be friends with everyone, even so-called good people. There is perversion everywhere, and it takes the mercy of God for a man's way to be preserved away from destruction and doom. Not even every good person can be your friend too. This reality places a demand on you, child of God, to wait prayerfully in God's presence for Him to show you who your true friends are the very sad truth is that the heart of man is very deep and mysterious. Only the blessed Holy Spirit of God has access to this human heart and to the deepest thoughts, intents, and tendencies of any man. Only God can give you a really true evaluation of yourself and of any other human being. No matter how close you are to a person, how deeply interwoven you may seem to be, the sad but true reality is that you can never truly know a person except for the mercy and help of God. Dear one, I need you to know just how important this prayer truly is in the life of a believer. Because a man cannot live on an island and must be in constant collaboration and communication with his environment and society. It is impossible to exist on the planet and do credible, timeless work without some sort of connection with society and the people in it. People were made to interact with their environment. If meeting, talking, and sharing with the people around us is then a necessity for our existence, it becomes imperative to know how to engage and with whom to engage. If he had been careless and this group had been careless, he would have been exposed to a world of pain and heartbreak and he would have dug the grave of the vision of God had so carefully placed in his hands. This said, you must know that no great man has ever been born into this world. They are all made, all carved into the very annals of history 
by the very choices they make, with every decision they make, every situation they allow to influence their lives. Every desire they bring to life as they seek the help and blessings of God in their endeavor and journey through heartfelt prayer. Although possessing divinity, Jesus prayed earnestly for so many days before stepping out of the desert, choosing and calling his disciples to continue with him on his journey of ministerial destiny. Yet, we step out into life, not considering that the wrong men have been placed by the enemy in our journey through life. We must pray for His help to choose the right godly people necessary for the fulfillment of God's purpose and plans for our lives.